So quick show of hands, who here has done any work on uh, like a serverless paradigm uh, using AWS Lambda or other function as a service? Right on. And who here has um, done any work in blockchain or distributed ledger? Right on. OK. Well, so I'm going to bring uh, both those topics together. Something to know about distributed ledger is on the Gartner hype cycle, it's at the peak right now. Uh, but it's, its buddy blockchain is in the middle of the trough of disillusionment. So we're going to kick it while it's down um, and talk about just doing distributed ledger without the blockchain. Um, serverless is also uh, in a pretty good position on the hype cycle. So this might be the most buzzwordy of all the talks today. My name's Chris Anderson. I'm the director of product at Fauna. And Woo. Um, my uh, background is as a co-founder of Couchbase and a, a technical contributor to uh, Apache CouchDB. So uh, the common thread through all that is building technologies that are um, you know, super compelling, easy, and fun for developers to be more productive with. Uh, I'm Jay Chris on Twitter. and. Uh, you can um, uh, reach out to me there or email me at chris at fauna.com. Uh, woo. So uh, my screen is not twitching. <laughs> so the blockchain, it's a data structure. It's essentially a linked list where every item in the list has a pointer to the previous item. And it's not just any pointer. It's a pointer with a cryptographic signature. And so what that means is that for any given uh, head of that chain, you can validate that the history all aligns and, and works together. So it's not particularly useful in and of itself, uh, except for to validate you know, the history of, of a data set. Now, blockchain has been. Um, combined with some other stuff, proof of work specifically, to make fighting over who gets to decide on that next head of the chain uh, into the sort of process that means that, that the whole data structure becomes immutable. Because once you've added a few links to the front, any deep link, the chances of it changing is very slim. So the blockchain uh, doesn't really, you know, get us uh, much except for some guarantees about immutability. If, uh, if you wanted to build a distributed ledger, you, know, you might be able to um, you know, do it just fine without the blockchain. And so hopefully, I don't know uh, about you, but myself, I think also that the, the Bitcoin and blockchain uh, world could be more imaginative, these, these things just look like the money that we're used to. So, but that's, that's an aside. Uh, either way, let's see what we can get done without the blockchain. And uh, the hashtag for today's talk is no blockchain. So if you want to tweet about that, then um, we, can all, we can all join the, um, the hype cycle together. So, a ledger. A ledger is a very simple accounting concept. It's just the idea of a table of transactions um, you know, from an account to another account. And uh, bankers can look over the ledger to see who has how much money. So a ledger is an old technology. It's kind of one of the reasons that humans invented writing. So it's, uh, it, it shouldn't be too surprising. But uh, the, the question is sort of, uh, you know, how can we get from there to a distributed ledger, especially without a blockchain? So what do we need is uh, we need a consensus. We need all the replication sites of the ledger to agree on the same data. And if we have that, then we've got a distributed ledger. There's nothing in the definition of a distributed ledger that says it has to be immutable. Uh, there's nothing that says it has to use a blockchain. It just needs to be 
the same account balances at all the replication sites. So uh, with Bitcoin, everyone who has a copy of you know, the full Bitcoin database has, a, has the ledger. Um, in the architecture that I'll be talking about, anyone who's running a database cluster has the ledger. So a distributed ledger, I think that the, it doesn't like photographs. It's just too much data. Um, but uh, a distributed ledger, again, will be where we can all agree on the same column of numbers, no matter you know, which site we're at. So if we're going to add a transaction in one place, we need to know for sure that it's going to appear in all the other places at the same time. So I'll talk about how to build this distributed ledger um, outside of the blockchain world. And the idea that it gives me that you know, it might be um, kind of obvious at this point, because you've talked to me at the booth, but this ledger that we looked at, just the plain simple ledger, it looks like a regular database application. It just looks like a database table. And it turns out that when you go look at how people implemented ledgers, you know, for the history of computers until now, they use the database. It's the right tool for the job. So my idea is like, well, if you have a distributed database, maybe a distributed ledger is just a database application. Maybe the ledger itself doesn't need to um, be concerned with the distribution mechanism. So we'll talk about how we can achieve that. And uh, specifically in the context of FaunaDB, so our logo is a hummingbird, but I like to look at, at real hummingbirds. So this is uh, you know, just a chance for us all to, to be happy about the glory of nature <laughs> and relax and look at a hummingbird. Um, now, how are we going to build this distributed ledger on top of a distributed database? Well, kind of, ooh, before we go, uh, actually, before we get into that. So what I did <laughs> is I thought, hey, this is a super easy idea. Like, it's just a database application using you know, uh, queries to maintain account balances. I'll make a demo. And so I made a pet store application, because you know, if you're going to do transactions, we all start with a pet store. And um, this, this should be a video of the demo, uh, but what, um, what you would see if the video was playing is essentially there's multiple players, and they all have account balances, and you can put an item for sale, and you can buy an item, and you know, when you buy an item, the money goes from that player, from the buyer's account to the seller's account. And when you, uh, you know, try to buy an item, and you don't have enough money in your account, then you get an insufficient funds error. So it's very simple, basic stuff, just uh, kind of an e-commerce or banking application. And the, uh, the underlying table that supports it, or the underlying uh, you know, database, looks like this. It's, uh, you know, here's the, the prices of the purchases, and the buyer and the seller were listed in the table. So you can look at this distributed ledger and browse it like, uh, you know, like any other data. So this demo is kind of a toy. I mean, I, I built it in a weekend. It wasn't designed to actually be a fully distributed um, ledger application. It is distributed, but some of the security concerns are not completely implemented. So uh, what we'll do in this talk is go look about how you would take that demo and make it serious. So the first thing that we want to do is take a look and understand how FaunaDB implements global consensus and what this means for a distributed ledger application. Then we're going to look at the actual transaction query and the code that implements uh, checking account balances and moving credits from one account to another and changing the ownership of an item. And so, uh, that's all run in a single transaction that gets submitted to the FaunaDB cluster and runs and returns a result. And we'll take a look at that code. And then, sort of, once you've understood the global consistency and the way that we've implemented the transaction, then you'll probably have some security questions because 
uh, if you're dealing with real money, there's going to be people who are uh, motivated to make your application do things other than what you hoped it would. So I'll talk about the security model, like application and object level security model. There's plenty of concerns about uh, encryption at rest or on the wire. Uh, maybe I can answer questions later on, but uh, this section of the talk will be about the security model uh, as it's implemented at the, um, the database object level. So back to this picture of global consensus. If what we're trying to do is keep these ledgers in sync, then uh, the architecture that I'm suggesting is we implement each ledger as a Fauna DB cluster. So uh, this can be the database in our, um, in our diagram language for today. And uh, what, what this will look like in practice is that, so you've got a, um, a group of uh, members of the ledger. And you know maybe this is a good time. I was a little distracted earlier. What I wanted to say is that if you don't trust the people that you're trying to run a distributed ledger with, don't do it this way. This is for when you know who your counterparties are. So like if you had a group of banks that were all working together to maintain a transaction clearing house, or if you had um, you know, kind of like essentially any group of actors where you could you know, identify them and address them via the legal system instead of um, some kind of you know, uh, a, a blockchain stuff. So the members of this consortium of uh, you know, uh, members of the market, each one runs a high availability Fauna DB cluster. So that cluster can be multiple machines, and it could even be in uh, multiple physical sites itself. Uh, but from a logical standpoint, what we're talking about is each member of the ledger has a copy of the ledger running in a database, and they can interact with it using database queries. Now, Within each one of those clusters, which contains the full copy of the data set, there's probably more than one machine so that you can have high availability. FaunaDB will handle partitioning the data across all the available machines and adding and removing machines, replicating between machines, and keeping this whole cluster in sync with the other clusters. So, if you're an uh, operations DevOps person, you might wonder, like, what do I have to do to stand one of these clusters up? It's a very simple operationally. You have a database that gets delivered as a jar, and you launch it in the right packaging for your environment, whether that is containers or uh, .deb or RPM files. So that's kind of the, the physical architecture of the cluster that will support our distributed ledger. Now, how do we do consistency across that physical architecture? There's a protocol called Calvin, which came out of research at Yale. And what it does, it provides acid transactions by uh, creating a distributed log. So in the same way that like, the blockchain is a distributed log, Rather than enforcing you know, those semantics via, via that kind of technology, we use the Calvin protocol, which uses, uh, are, is anyone familiar with Raft or Paxos? So these are distributed consensus protocols that allow uh, a group of machines to agree about something with the minimum number of round trips. So we use Raft to decide what the next log segment is. Uh, there's some, some secret sauce about you know, making sure that the transactions are ordered within the log in a way that um, you know, makes sense according to the transactional requirements. So if two people submit transactions to touch the same key at the same time, then the system will order them in one way or the other. But once it's ordered, then it'll be stable and serializable. This is the same sort of thing that happens inside of your relational databases that you're familiar with. So this Calvin log, which has the transactions in it, uh, is where the commit actually occurs. So just like when you commit to Postgres, it's an entry written in the write-ahead log, and if there was a server crash, it could recover from the write-ahead log. In the same way, the Calvin log 
um, you know, runs ahead of the physical storage, index storage, et cetera. And everything that happens to the database layer is deterministic based on the transactions that got accepted into the log. So that makes uh, consensus relatively cheap and uh, focused on throughput. There's uh, an alternate model in the marketplace for distributed consensus. Uh, if you've heard of Google Spanner, they use a, a different protocol, which is based on uh, time windows and looking at the right effects of the transaction after it plays out and retrying things when they conflict. Um, so in practice, what that means is that under contention, a uh, Google Spanner style system will slow down on reads, whereas uh, for FaunaDB, the reads can typically be done from snapshots in an uncoordinated way, but under contention, it would slow down under writes. So it's a different trade-off. I think that the FaunaDB trade-off is better suited for interactive applications, since most applications are mostly read. So if you're interested in learning more about the Calvin protocol, there's this uh, blog post on our website that compares Spanner versus Calvin and goes through a lot of the trade-offs and you know, kind of finds the, um, the scenarios at the limit where one of them would be better than the other in a clear way, and then how those trade-offs apply uh, at runtime. So, so that's, we sort of maybe understand a little bit how we offer this global consistency. Uh, now that we understand that you can have acid transactions at global scale, well, what are we going to run in order to get the job done? So this is the actual transaction code. It's meant to look complicated. I hope your eyes glazed over a little bit. We'll go in and look at it one line at a time where you can actually see what the query language looks like. The story that I'm telling here with this is just so that you understand that the complex logic of like, an actual rich transaction can be written as a single query and submitted to the Fauna cluster where it'll commit atomically. So I'll go through, uh, first I'll bold the lines that matter as far as telling the story of what's going on, and then I'll go through and show you what they do. So uh, this first one is just making sure that the item is for sale. We can't try to buy something that's not on the for sale list. Uh, right here, we just don't want you to sell it to yourself. Instead of selling an item to yourself in this application, we just remove it from sale. So those are just a couple of preconditions to be met. Here's where we actually remove it from sale. You don't need to worry too much about this, except for to see that we're just setting an application flag here. This, uh, this last bit is the last precondition check. We're just making sure that the buyer has enough money in there, enough credits in their account to purchase the item. If they don't, then they'll get an insufficient funds error. So the second half of the query is where the transaction is actually written to the objects. Here we're creating a purchase record. It's just uh, essentially um, you know, the receipt of that particular transaction with the buyer, the seller, the price, and the item. So you can look at the history of all the purchases through your system. In that same block, then we're also updating the buyer by subtracting the item price from their balance and updating the seller by adding the item price to their balance. And finally, we're marking the item with a new owner. So to summarize all that, we're ensuring that the item is for sale, we're making sure the buyer is not the seller, and we're making sure the buyer has enough money. Then we're writing out a purchase record, and we're deducting from the buyer's balance, adding to the seller's balance, and updating the item owner. And all that commits atomically. So if, uh, if you had a very busy buyer and they submitted you know, multiple purchase orders and uh, you know, simultaneously, some of those would succeed, but only up until the account balance would be you know, deducted below zero by the next one. So there's never an ability to uh, 
spend the money before the system has noticed that you've spent it. Uh, it's, it's always consistent there. There, if you go follow the link to GitHub, you can see the rest of the application. There's the transaction, or rather the query that lists all the items that are for sale. There's the query that um, you know, lists for each player what items do they have and how much money is in their balance. So it's all very standard database interactions. You query the database and paint stuff to the UI. So here we'll look at an example of how the query language actually looks up close. So what's going on here is it's actually a query builder. This text does not ship to the server. This happens at runtime, and it creates an abstract syntax tree, and the abstract syntax tree is shipped to the server. So what that means is that in this particular case, the native language is JavaScript, but you can write the same query in Ruby, and it'll have the same abstract syntax tree and give you the same results. So we've got clients available in Java, JavaScript, Scala, which is what the database server is implemented in, Ruby, C Sharp, Python, Go, and Swift. And if you need to query the database from a language that we don't support, the wire interface is JSON and HTTP. So you should be able to submit queries that way as well. So to summarize this section about ACID transactions, I think it's important to note that I've been talking a lot about financial services, and the reason I've been talking about it is because that industry was left out of the NoSQL revolution. All these uh, scalable databases came out, but they didn't have transaction support. And so financial services was stuck you know, running on their oracles and their Postgres. Uh, now that we have ACID transactions at global scale, the financial services firms that wanted to explore these new uh, large-scale databases but found that they did not have the features to meet the requirements, uh, all of a sudden have this option. So from uh, my perspective in the marketplace, having uh, you know, worked through the first wave of NoSQL and then seeing what uh, different customers and users are doing now, companies are a lot more uh, ready. They, they understand how to evaluate database technology. Um, how to you know, try out two or three alternatives and figure out which one is the best fit. And they're using that understanding uh, essentially to evaluate FaunaDB versus, uh, you know, there's not much else, versus Postgres or Oracle um, or Google Spanner, which you know, then you are stuck running inside the Google Cloud. But uh, so let's set aside financial services for now because I also find that writing database applications using eventually consistent databases can be a headache. You, you might write something in the database and then go back to read it and it's not there yet. And so that means in practice, all your code that ever touches an eventually consistent database like DynamoDB or Cassandra has to be ready for that worst case scenario. And you get a ton of code complexity and repair work, and your developers are kind of more trying to second guess the database than they are actually writing the application. So if you use a consistent database, you know, like a Postgres or a FaunaDB, those problems go away. And you don't have to guess what's in the database. You're just able to write queries and get the expected responses. Now, it is, you know, it's, it's just the laws of physics that in order for us to commit a Calvin transaction across multiple data centers, uh, the speed of light between those data centers starts to matter. And so, sure, like it is possible to have uh, lower write latencies with an eventually consistent database, but I'm not sure that actually makes your application faster because, you know, you're writing but there's this cloud of uncertainty, and then you've always got to check up on that uncertainty when you're doing your reads, and so it may balance out that, that even by paying a small round trip time cost on writes, all the simplification of the reads and the simplification of developing against it could mean you know, simpler application and potentially better user experience. 
So we have this idea, excuse me, <coughs> of how to build a distributed ledger using the database queries and global consensus and acid transactions, but I haven't addressed the security model at all. So this is uh, you know, just kind of to give uh, the sense that there's uh, you know, the approach to how you would avoid privilege escalation and get some of the semantics that people appreciate from the blockchain without having uh, you know, some of the downsides. So you know, we like that the blockchain is immutable, except for when we don't. Um, and in the same way, you want to know what your, um, you, you want to know that your transaction code can only, you know, write new transactions and won't be changing the history, but you might have admin code that needs to change the history. So we take a layered approach where we essentially have, you know, user code in the browser, uh, application code running in Lambda, but the application code has the minimum privileges to talk to the database, which has its own um, you know, user-defined functions, which have the minimum privileges, again, to talk to the actual storage parts of the database. So it's very, um, it, you, you, there's no path there for privilege escalation that would allow an untrusted user to run transactions that they're not supposed to. So I'll uh, talk about each of those in turn and how, um, you know, how the layers work together. So Lambda is a function as a service provider. There's lots of them. For purposes of this talk, they're interchangeable. Essentially, it's just a JavaScript function or, or in another language that runs in uh, response to user events. So this could be... Uh, you know, authenticating users on an HTTP request and running a function that kicks off a transaction. But it's also how, uh, at least in practice, when I talk to people who do a lot of stuff with AWS Lambda, they're kind of using it for lightweight MapReduce. So maybe processing files every time they're uploaded to S3. It, kinda, it straddles both those worlds. In our case, we're using it for interactive code to trigger the transactions in the database. So what we'll have is a JavaScript function that uses the FaunaDB client to submit a query that looks very simple. So that complex query that we saw, uh, it, was, um, it was the whole thing, right? It was all the actual logic that's going to happen. But we don't want our lambdas to be able to run that logic because like, what if they only ran part of it? What if you had a bad programmer in your organization and they wrote a function that sold items to players without deducting from their balance, right? Then all of a sudden you might have to, you know, pay up yourself that money um, or something. So it could be very expensive mistakes. But instead of having Lambda call that complex function we saw, we have it call a predefined function. So this is, um, you know, similar to relational database APIs where you can register a query uh, and, and have it called. So there's uh, essentially query fragments that you register with the database, and other queries can call into them, and they can have different privileges. So the function that uh, is called can only, uh, 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 it, it does what it does, and the, the database administrator knows what it does, and it's the only thing that Lambda can call. Well, the function itself its internals would look like that complex transaction that we saw. So it's easy to call, but it doesn't give you, right, you only send it some arguments, and it does all the work. So uh, like a trigger in a relational database. And again, that function doesn't have administrator access, so uh, someone authoring that trigger wouldn't be able to go and zero out everyone's account balance um, they would just be able to, you know, interact with the classes that they're supposed to. Now, the last uh, kind of important feature for replacing the blockchain in this application is FaunaDB's built-in temporal data, which can be used here uh, to ensure uh, that we understand what the history of objects are, which it can also be used in applications for auditing or 
for those times when you have to change the past. So what uh, in the architecture we're talking about for a serverless distributed ledger application, the functions that are touching the data in the tables will run with privileges that can only talk about the present. They can't mess with the past. And they also can't change the schema. You don't want them to be able to change the rules. Um, so these functions with limited privileges. But in real life, sometimes things happen, like a user might hit an extra zero and transfer you know, $20,000 instead of 2000 And rolling that back on a blockchain-based application can be very expensive because the history is actually immutable and you've got to come up with a compensating transaction that would make up for the old one. And it's probably not just those $18,000, it's probably the tax implications for the, you know, the 10 hours before the bug got caught or whatever. So it's better to have an administrative uh, client with additional privileges that can go back in the history and say, I didn't really mean 20,000, I meant 2,000. And when you change it there, then of course all the queries that are deriving you know, things like taxes, et cetera, from that are gonna run on this revised history instead of on the, um, you know, instead of on the erroneous data. The, the temporal data support, it's, uh, by default it'll store like 30 days of history. You could turn that up or you can turn it down. But uh, it is not only supporting these kind of audit queries, but also supporting uh, the ability to read from snapshots so that you can read from a consistent version of the database without waiting for uh, in-flight writes to complete. So that's the architecture of this distributed ledger application uh, on a distributed database. And uh, I, I'm happy to take questions now. Sure. So the question is about the CAP theorem and how if we prioritize consistency over availability, you know, what, does, what does that mean when there's an availability problem? So in practice, we have, um, you know, it's rare because we don't need 100% availability of all the machines in the cluster. We just need to maintain a quorum. So as long as we maintain a quorum, then the transaction log can continue to be processed and uh, we have uptime. But if we go below the quorum, then we can't process transactions at all. Question? So yeah, we get the consistency that you get, you know, that people use two-phase commits for. Uh, we use the raft protocol for that, which is an optimization over like a raw two-phase commit or a Paxos style uh, consensus algorithm. And um, there's a great website. I think if you Google learn raft, It'll, it's a state machine that lets you see like, exactly how the raft protocol is executed on um, a log. And we essentially use that same protocol. So uh, it's like two-phase commit, but with some optimizations to cut down on the round trips. And where it fits in our architecture is how we decide the ordering of that log, the write-ahead log for Calvin. Once the log's order is stable and frozen, then everything that happens on the database nodes is deterministic. So all we need to do is agree on the log ordering, and then we get serializable consistency from there. Uh, I have a, qu a couple of questions from the app. Uh, why should I use FaunaDB? What's the use case for FaunaDB specific? Sure. Well, it's the consistency for the various reasons I outlined. Some applications, some use cases require consistency, and for some use cases, it just helps with productivity. But I think the real reason to use, I don't know, um, a database, at least as a developer who evaluates new technologies on a regular basis, like we like to think that we're rational and that we're taking a measured approach all the time. But I think that probably what's really happening is we have like a high stakes game of picking what is the low friction path. And so if something gives you friction, even for an unrelated reason, like you're probably gonna throw it out and try something else. Because like, oh, the friction there must be an indicator there's gonna be friction other places. 
Um, so with that philosophy in mind, uh, we've tried very hard at Fauna to make the on-ramps easy. So you should be able to go to fauna.com and sign up and be using the API for free within minutes. Uh, if, if that stays easy, then you'll, there will be no friction, and you won't even need good reasons to use it. <laughs> uh, one question that's a little bit uh, next to that. Uh, how does Fauna compare to Cassandra? Sure. So Fauna and Cassandra have similar scalability characteristics. Uh, the you know, kind of rough size of clusters that we expect people to run is about the same. The read latency is similar. And uh, you know, sort of like the amount of aggregate I.O. that a given node can do is similar. When you start to do comparative benchmarks, they're also pretty close. Uh, in some workloads, we have a throughput advantage because we're batching the transactions together in a way that is easier for the I.O. systems to deal with. But in other workloads, you're, with Fauna, you'll be waiting on round trip times and consistent commits that you wouldn't need to wait for with Cassandra. Of course, then with Cassandra, on the other end, you'd have to go clean that stuff up on read and have a bunch of extra code to deal with the error cases. And uh, so Sauna, uh, Fauna DB is consistent and partitioned. Can you say a bit more about how availability is affected then? About the partitioning? No. Uh, Fauna DB is consistent in partition, so can you say a bit more about how availability is affected then? Maybe the one asked can elaborate. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, type this question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about the partitioning. So we actually allow you to partition the Calvin log into more than one log, so that you know if the throughput on the Calvin log is more than a single machine can handle, then you can spread that out across machines. Uh, but typically, you're going to get best performance with about three Calvin partitions. Uh, is there an open source version? No, we're not open source. Uh, we're implemented in Scala. All our drivers are open source. But the delivery is a jar file. And the query builder seems convolu convoluted. How to pronounce? Sorry. <laughs> Do you consider simplifying the API with a DSL that compiles to an AST? So the question is about the query builder and um, you know, whether we've considered simpler APIs. So we considered, we seriously considered like a, a REST style CRUD API, and it, it, it's in there. Um, but it's, uh, it just turns out that the sweet spot for an, a database like this is to submit a complex query, so something like uh, load rows from an index out of a particular range, and then loop over those rows all inside of the transaction, and load documents based on those rows. From some of those documents have conditional logic that maybe loads other data, and then update some of them based on all that and have that commit atomically. So just doing that over REST doesn't make much sense. It's more like you, know, you want to write some of your application logic up into the query language and push it to the cluster. One last question. Uh, blockchains are public ledgers, meaning everyone can join a network of nodes. Does FaunaDB also allow to build such open systems? Sure. So the question is about, uh, could you use this kind of system in place of the Bitcoin blockchain? And the answer is, no, that's not what it's for. If you need to run those kind of applications among untrusted parties, then you do need you know, some way of uh, you know, proof of work or otherwise making sure that people can't, can't game the system. With uh, what we're talking about, a trusted uh, consortium of market participants, there are, uh, you know, I, I didn't go into that part of the architecture, but there are places in the system where you could put monitors on the transaction log and make sure that no one's, you know, trying to fuzz the system or something. Uh, but you know, typically, if somebody was, you would know who was doing that, and you could talk to them. So th that, that's a, it's a different use case, basically. OK, cool. Uh, any other questions from the room? Uh, so you have the um, yeah, so uh, the question is about the, the TTL, the time to live feature, which it, it allows. Uh, we actually have two sets of TTL. So I talked about how we keep 
object history around for 30 days by default and then clean that up. But we also have the objects themselves can auto delete after a certain amount of time. So that's really useful for use cases like uh, GDPR where you know, the, the, the right to erase all and whatever. So especially um, intermediate processors may want to have a lot of their data use TTLs so that when they're done processing, it cleans itself up. Um, so it's useful you know, not just for GDPR, but also for you know, caching use cases or anything where you want the database to um, you know, not just grow continuously over time. That's Question in the back? Yeah. Sure. So uh, the customer list, I, most of them I can't talk about. Uh, we only launched the cloud product earlier this year, and we'll be launching the on-premise enterprise version in the springtime. Currently, NVIDIA is running a big social network on top of FaunaDB, and they've had zero downtime, so we like that. Uh, also, Starbucks is talking a lot at conferences, mostly on the West Coast, about using us for um, payment card and loyalty program stuff. So essentially, you know, financial points um, across all of their retail locations. Uh, aside from that, there's you know, lots of the innovative uh, American banks you know, have ongoing programs to evaluate new technologies, so uh, we're in that space for sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks, this everyone. was the last, oh, yeah, go oh. on. <laughs> <laughs>